Salut Thierry. Bonjour Philippe. Ça va, on va. We will wait a few seconds, you know. I'm just ready. The... I'm ready. I'm, uh, to be on time, it's uh, 59. We said uh, 5, I think. To be precisely on 5 p.m. <clears throat> yes, we can wait a little bit. Okay, I think we can start. Uh, Thierry, ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I think it's uh, it's five now. It's when you want. So, uh, f hello everyone. Um, my name is uh, Philippe Landreau. I'm uh, the Exbone uh, Chief Medical Officer. I would like to thank you for attending our third live broadcast for the Exbone Forum. We are very happy with that. So just to re remind you uh, that uh, this is done to maintain our uh, educational platform interaction with all our colleagues, surgeons, doctors, physio, nurse, and uh, all professionals, even some of our, our, our patients, if they're interested. Uh, you must know that this, uh, uh, this video will be available forever uh, to revisit at any time on our uh, DxBone channel. So you can go to dxbone.com to find them, or even uh, faster, you go to DxBone uh, YouTube channel. And if you subscribe, uh, by pressing the button uh, below this uh, presentation. We, um, first of all, thank you for the support and we will appreciate and uh, it, you will be informed for any uh, further uh, video because we will do uh, a lot more. Uh, in this live <clears throat> forum, I'm very happy to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Thierry Moffis, our uh, head of rehabilitation and musculoskeletal uh, consultant. He's uh, specialized in the spine and electrophysiology. He is a Belgium with over uh, more than 20 years of experience in Belgium and Qatar. And now he joined uh, our uh, DxBone team to drive this project to uh, excellence. I will be uh, moderating, moderating sorry, this, uh, this uh, live uh, broadcasting. Uh, for those who are not comfortable, you will lo look at um, on your screen beside the um, the video, or I don't know, it depends if it is a computer uh, or a, a, a phone or a iPad. You you will have a box. You can find a box of chat, and if you uh, log in, you can ask your question. Or please type your question clearly, and uh, with the team, we'll collect all the questions, and then uh, Dr. Thierry Monfils, after his lecture, which will be 25, 30 minutes. We'll answer to all the questions, and even after 30 minutes, you can still ask questions. We, we, we plan to have uh, one hour maximum of uh, live broadcasting, and uh, feel free to ask the question because this is the, the purpose is to be very, uh, very uh, interactive. Uh, Dr. Thierry Mouffis, now you have the microphone, and I will let uh, you uh, uh, do your presentation, which is about a controversial topic, the scapular dyskinesis, and it's, I'm sure we learn a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Philippe, for these kind words and introduction. And I will try during this presentation to a little bit talk about uh, the scapular dyskinesis and to answer a different question about the scapular dyskinesis. First of all, what are we talking about? What is a scapular dyskinesis? And what is it versus a normal position or motion of the scapula? What are the possible causes? What are the possible consequences of the scapular dyskinesis? And most of all, what is the important relation between the scapular dyskinesis and shoulder injuries? What is the cause? What is the consequence? So what's first, the chicken or the egg? Is the scapular dyskinesis a possible cause of shoulder injury, or on the contrary, is the shoulder injury a possible cause of scapular dyskinesis? How to identify the scapular dyskinesis, the cause, the consequence? And with this first five question, to answer the most important question, is the scapular dyskinesis to be treated and how? For example, if you have a scapular dyskinesis without any other symptoms, is this scapular dyskinesis to be treated? And if this scapular dyskinesis is related to a shoulder injury, what is to be treated first? Is it 
the scapular dyskinesis or is it the shoulder injury? So for the definition, definition the first description has been done by Burkhardt. But Kibler in 2010 gave the name of scapular dyskinesis to every altered scapular dynamic motion. And in 2017, to this defi definition, he added the concept of alteration of static scapular position. So now this term uh, covers many different posi abnormal positions of movement of the scapula. It's winging, it's shrugging, it's stuttering of the scapula. So to define a scapular dyskinesis, first we have to know, even if it's a static or dynamic scapular dyskinesis, we have to know what is the normal position of the scapula, what is the normal motion, and most of all, what is the normal biomechanic of the kinematic of the scapula. So what is the normal scapular motion? The normal scapular motion is based on elementary movement in three planes and two direction translation. First of all, upward rotation, downward rotation of the scapula around uh, anterior post posterior axis. Then internal rotation, external rotation around this vertical axis along the medial scapular border. The anterior tilting of the scapula, the posterior tilting around this horizontal axis along the scapular spine. Elevation and depression translation of the scapula and abduction or protraction, abduction or retraction on, of the scapula. But the first thing you have to know that biomechanically speaking, the motion of the scapula is rarely in only one plane of translation. It's a more a combination of different elementary movement. And more than that, this scapulothoracic motion is to be integrated in the shoulder motion, including the genera, the glenohumeral uh, angle joint, for, sorry, the sternoclavicular joint, the acromoclavicular joint, and the subacromial space to, real, to realize what Kodman called the scapulohumeral rhythm. More than that, you also have to integrate this shoulder movement in the body kinetic chain. You can easily imagine that to throw something, the joints and the muscle from the feet to the fingers are involved. So now what is necessary to have a normal scapula humeral rhythm? You need a very good muscle activation and coordination. You need normal structure of the bones and joints. For example, you need a good orientation of the, glen the glenoid fossa the version, also the humeral head version. You need a very good joint stability warranted by ligaments with capsule. You need good muscle for the joint stability and you need this concavity compression system here illustrated by a very beautiful drawing from Dr. Philippe with the geometry of the glenoid joints and the participation of the muscle compressing the humeral head on the glenoid fossa. You can easily imagine that in case of failure of one of these factors, you open the door to scapular dyskinesis. More in detail for muscle activation and coordination, you need an intact first and second motor neurons. You need intact muscle for sure, but you need also a good motor control, good proprioception, good feedback, good coordination of the muscle activation. So what are those muscles for the scapular dyskinesis? The most important are the scapulothoracic muscle, the levator scapula, pectoris minor, rhomboidus, serratus anterior, and the three trapezius, the upper, the middle, and the lower trapezius. Accessorily, you can consider scapulohumeral muscles, the rotator cuff and the osseous. Now, to detect a visible alteration in the position, static or kinematic motion, you have to consider different patterns of scapular dyskinesis. You also have to consider different responsible factor of the scapular dyskinesis. And most of all, you have to analyze the possible relation to shoulder injuries. And why to analyze all this? It's because there is many kinds of scapular dyskinesis and each has a different treatment or could have a different treatment. 
So the different patterns of winging as uh, have first been described by described by Burkhardt, and you can see the tip one, tip two, tip three illustrated here with the tip one with an inferior medial scapular border prom prominence, the type two with medial, and the type three with superior medial prominence of the scapular border. The type one is mostly related here to lower trapezius, to latissimus dorsi, and to serratus anterior weakness, and or to pectoris minor tightness. The type two is mostly related to serratus anterior, rhomboideus, and middle trapezius weakness. For the three, type three, it's mostly related to upper trapezius weakness or levatoscapular tightness. Uh, beside those uh, patterns of winging, we also have many scapular humeral rhythm disturbance, for example, premature or excessive motion of the scapula in different planes or stuttering of the scapular motion. So what are the responsible factors? And I told you before that to have an harmonious scapular humeral rhythm, you need different factors. And if one of these factor is failing, you open the door to the scapular dyskinesis. So abnormal muscle activation and coordination is a possible responsible factor. For example, neuropathies, muscle tear detachment, altered motor control, eventually uh, consecutive to a pain syndrome, muscle disbalance, disbalance in, in power, in flexibility, in endurance, and also some tightness in the capsular ligamentous system. So you have also the possibility to have the structural bone and joint issue as a responsible factor. For example, a fracture, fracture malunion, fracture nonunion, for example, of the clavicle or the scapula. You can also have a trouble in the glenoid or the humor head version, ante or retroversion. You can have a snapping scapula, for example, in this picture, a nosteochondroma of the deep side of the scapula. You can have also a scoliosis or hyperkyphosis of the thoracic spine. Joint instability is a possible responsible factor, instability in the AC joint, acromioclavicular, or glenohumeral joints, and also internal joint derangement like osteoarthritis impingement and labral tear in those two joints. So now for the clinical assessment, what is a scapular dyskinesis? Is there any scapular dyskinesis? Is there any associated shoulder injury to this dyskinesis? And is the patient complaint and the shoulder injury related to the scapular dyskinesis? What is first, the chicken or the egg? And those three questions are very important to consider the treatment. Do we have to treat as prevention a scapular dyskinesis in absence of, of any symptoms? And if there is an association between scapular dyskinesis and pain or uh, dysfunction of the, the shoulder. What is to be treated first? Is, is, is it the scapular dyskinesis or the shoulder injury? So some words about the prevalence of scapular dyskinesis uh, with this Kibler study who told that more than 60% of asymptomatic overhead athletes have uh, scapular dyskinesis. And on the contrary, only 30% of asymptomatic non-overhead athletes have prisons uh, scapular dyskinesis. So it seems to have a clear relation between some activities like overhead activities and the prevalence of scapular dyskinesis. Moreover, Burkhardt showed that more than 90% of overhead athletes with shoulder or elbow injury have a scapular dyskinesis. So there is a clear relation between scapular dyskinesis and shoulder injury. And consider the scapular dyskinesis treatment could be considered the, the symptom or the injury treatment in itself. So now what about the systematic clinical assessment described by Kibler with three different steps, the visual observation of rest and motion, the effect on the, of the manual correction of the dyskinesis on the symptoms and the evaluation of the surrounding tissue. More in details, for the, the observation at rest, 
posteriorly, you can check the alignment of the scapula, an eventual asymmetry of the right and left scapula, and an eventual scoliosis of the thoracic spine. Laterally, a kyphosis of the spine, an eventual forward head or forward shoulder posture, and you can measure the lateral scapula slide. In this drawer, you see this distance between the inferior angle of the scapula and the spinous process. The difference between right and left shouldn't exceed 1.5 centimeter, and this measure has to be done at rest and at abduction 90 degree of the arm, eventually asking the patient to put his hands on the hips. The validity of this test is not very good because of many false positive, and there is no consensus on the attitude to have if this uh, dysfunction of the scapula is bilateral. Now the, the observation at motion based on this scapular dyskinesis test described by McClure, asking the patient to do a weighted or manually resisted like in this picture. Flexion and abduction remind you that the flexion is an elevation of the arm in the sagittal plane and abduction is the same elevation but in the frontal plane. So the test is positive uh, in case of winging of the scapula or in case of any dysrhythmia at elevation or at lowering of elevation, elevation, sorry. This test has a better validity, especially in flexion. Now you saw that there is a visual and observable scapular dyskinesis. What about the manual correction test or alteration test? These are manually redirecting scapular motion. So you try with your hand to modify and to correct this scapular dyskinesis and to see the effect on this, of this correction on the pain and the dysrhythmia. When this test is positive, you can consider that this scapular dyskinesis is a contributing factor of the shoulder injury or the pain. So there is two different scapular uh, tests, the assistance and the retraction test described also by Kibble. The first one, the scapular assistance here shown is a manually assisted scapular upward rotation during the arm scaption, active arm scaption. Remind you that the scaption is the elevation in the scapular plane, 30 to 40 degrees anterior to the frontal plane, and to observe the effect of this correction on the pain. The scapular retraction test here shown on the right and below is a manually supported medial scapular border with the left forearm in this example. So you ask the patient to retract the scapula actively, you maintain this retraction, and you ask the patient to do a resisted 90 degrees arm scaption in full internal rotation. And again, you observed the effect on the pain and also in this case on the strength modification. Now you have a visible uh, scapular dyskinesis and the test, the manual correction tests are positive relating this scapular dyskinesis to the shoulder injury. You have to identify the responsible factors of the SD. Could be muscle weakness, especially the scapular thoracic muscles, motor control disturbance, postural abnormalities, or loss of flexibility. To test the strength of the serratus anterior muscles, which is an upward rotator muscles, an internal rotator muscle, and a protractor muscles, you ask the patient to do an elevation in flexion, resisting manually to this movement and observing an eventual winging. For the trapezius, muscles, which is a key scapular stabilizer of the scapula in arm abduction, you test it manually with a resistance uh, at the horizontal abduction, observing an eventual early scapular breaking. To test more specifically the lower trapezius, as shown in this picture on the right, I, push, I ask the patient to be prone uh, the abduction of the arm at 135 degrees and exerting a force, a posterior anterior force to the elbow and posterior, on the posterior lateral part of the acronym. 
for the middle trapezius, trump the test is the same, but asking the patient to, to uh, do an abduction at 90 degrees only. For the upper trapezius, you can uh, test it with a resisted scapular elevation or shoulder shrugging. Now, for the muscle strength of the rhomboidus, it's a little bit more difficult because it's difficult to dissociate the uh, rhomboidus test from the trapezius, the middle trapezius, especially test. So I use uh, for myself a uh, position of the patient prone with the scapular retraction with the arm abducted at 90 degrees, and I exert an anterior posterior force only to the posterior acromion. For the pectoris minor, it is completely different. Why? Because this protractor and depressure muscles, it's involved in scapular dyskinesis quite only when it is too tight. So what you have to observe is an eventual uh, retraction of this muscle, measuring the distance of this pectoris minor, like on the left picture, or integrating this pectoris minor tightness in the forward shoulder posture and measuring the distance between the anterior acromion and the wall. So the, posterior, the pectoris minus is involved in anterior shoulder tightness. What about the posterior shoulder tightness? Eventually because of posterior capsule tightness or rotator calf muscle tightness. You have to test it in three different tests. The, on the left side, the internal rotation at 90 degree abduction. In the middle, the spinal level reached with the hand behind the back. And on the right picture, the pure horizontal abduction fixing the scapula. Now, how to evaluate the disability? McClure gave us a three levels grading system with a high level disability characterized by a poor motor, motor function a lot of pain and disability and a guarding from the patient and the low level was also poor motor function but low level of pain and disability. In the low level of disability, the physiotherapist can directly begin with loaded rehabilitation exercise. And in case of high level disability, it's better to begin with minimal loading and pain management techniques. Now, the relation and the important relation between scapular dyskinesis and injury. And I will begin with this quote I like from Thomas, who told us that the scapular dyskinesis is not a diagnosis. It is not an injury, but it is a really true risk factor for shoulder injury. So if you have a clavicle fracture, you can have a lateral fragment rotation you can, have, you can have a lateral fragment angulation, or you can have a clavicle shortening, and both are potentially causing scapular dyskinesis. So the orthopedic surgeon has to be restored the anatomy, the anatomy perfectly during the reduction. If you have a glenohumeral osteoarthritis or, and or a rotator cuff atropathy with massive tear, you will have a restricted range of motion of the glenohumeral joint. And compensatory, you will have an increased range of motion of the scapulothoracic uh, joint. So you will have a scapular dyskinesis. In that case of association, the treatment is based on the treatment of the injury first, with rehabilitation, with shoulder, with reverse shoulder arthropathy. But you cannot forget to consider the scapular dyskinesis rehabilitation. Uh, before surgery during rehabilitation or after an atroposty. When you have a scapular muscle detachment for the treatment, it's a little bit more simple because you obviously have to treat first the injury by rehabilitation surgery. So in case of scapular muscle detachment, mostly on the lower trapezius and rhomboidus, you will have a weakness and a loss of control of the scapula. So you will increase drastically the risk of su subacromial impingement and the risk of rotator cuff lesion. What about the snapping scapula, which is an audible and palpable crepitus at scapulothoracic motion? You have to analyze the different causes. Could be a chronic bursitis, infra and supra serratus anterior bursitis. 
it could be an anatomical particularity, curved scapular, scoliosis, fracture, tumor. Or it can be a muscle dysfunction. A simple scapular dyskinesis is a responsible factor of snapping scapula. So for the treatment, it's still interesting because if you have a bursitis, the first thing you have to treat is the bursitis with an injection, corticoid injection. For the other causes, you have first to consider the rehabilitation as the treatment for two possible reasons. For example, because there is no surgical possibility options. Because, for example, in the curved scapula, you cannot operate it. Or because the rehabilitation is the first step of treatment before to eventually consider surgery in case of failure. Now, what's the relation with glenohumeral instability? Many authors showed that in uh, glenohumeral instability, there is more than 60% of scapular dyskinesis. But the problem is what is the cause? What is the consequence? Again, what's first, the chicken or the egg? We know that in glenohumeral instability, if you have in scapular dyskinesis, there is no specific, no specific kind of scapular dyskinesis related. We also know that scapular dyskinesis is for sure able to participate or potentiate the glenohumeral instability, and so the scapular dyskinesis has absolutely uh, to be considered in the rehabilitation. For the treatment, there is some consensus to say that in case of post-traumatic anterior or posterior instability with a bank heart lesion, we have first to treat the injury. On the contrary, if it's an overuse microtraumatic glenohumeral instability often related to muscle disbalance, the first thing you have to treat is the scapular dyskinesis. Now, the important relation between impingement and rotator cuff lesion and the scapular dyskinesis. And a quote from Kibler, who said that without appropriate rehabilitation of the scapular dyskinesis, the true nature of the rotator cuff lesion is difficult to ascertain and may lead to improper treatment. So it's important to consider the scapular dyskinesis in the rehabilitation as the first treatment in any impingement shoulder. I will give you an example of the overhead athletes. You know that in athletes, they have fatigue during the activity. There is two kinds of different fatigue, the central neural fatigue inducing a comp compensatory muscle recruitment, so a scapular dyskinesis. And there is also mechan mechanical fatigue, a more peripheral fatigue related muscle micro damage inducing neural feedback and scapular dyskinesis. So this has been proved by many studies, for example, Loader, who showed that there is more 80% uh, more scapular dyskinesis only after one session of swimming training. And this could lead to impingement shoulder. Uh, Joshua Dines, one of our co colleagues in Aspeta with other authors, uh, confirmed that there is many uh, scapular dyskinesis related impingement in baseball pitches during the season related to fatigue. So there is another question. Do we have to do a preventive treatment in case of scapular dyskinesis without any symptoms? And I think that especially in the overhead athletes like swimmers or others, this has to be considered. Now, a very, very important chapter in this presentation. What about the neuropathies as a cause of scapular dyskinesis? Because neuropathies are one of the first causes to be excluded when you have a visible scapular dyskinesis. Che checking the long thoracic nerve, checking the accessory spinal nerve and the scapular dorsal nerve. Accessorily, the suprascapular nerve, the axillary nerve that control a muscle from the scapulohumeral motion. So have an indirect effect on the scapular dyskinesis. But what is important is to consider two different uh, differential diagnoses, the radiculopathy C5, C6, because most of the muscles around the shoulder are innervated by those two roots and the Parsonage and Turner disease, which is an inflammatory disease of the brachial plexus, and that mimic 
the peripheral neuropathy in some case, and it's difficult to do the diagnosis. So first, and the most frequent and important in scapulodiscalysis, assessment of the long thoracic nerve, uh, sometimes responsible of serratus anterior palsy. This nerve is susceptible to neuropraxic lesion, rarely uh, axonot maze, rarely neurot mazes, and this nerve is susceptible to stretch injury, rarely compression or penetrating trauma. So often the symptoms are delayed, eh? could have some upper limb weakness, especially in flexion, and there is uh, mostly a scapular dyskinesis. So it's very important for you to recognize any scapular dyskinesis that because it's mostly the first and mainly the first uh, symptom you can see in the patient. If you have a palsy of the serratus anterior, you will have a dominance of other muscles, the levator scapula, the rhomboidus, the trapezius. So at rest, you can see a scapula pulled medially and superiorly. At the testing in this video, a candy provided by our friends, Boris Poberage, uh, you can see the clinical examination of a long thoracic nerve palsy uh, showing this medial scapular border prominence at elevation and essentially at lowering, so at eccentric movement. And you can see that the scapula is retracted. It's important at 90 degree flexion. You also have this wall, very known, very well known test, the wall test, asking the patient to do um, pumping on the wall, which is more a fatty test for the beginning stage of the LTN lesion. So what about electroneuromyography? So electromyography and nerve conduction studies. It's important because it's the only way to objectify any peripheral neuropathy, to know which nerve is involved, where is the lesion, is it a neuropraxia, is it an axonot mesis, is it a neurot mesis, what is the grade of the lesion, is it an acute or a chronic lesion? And what about the re-innovation process in the healing process? In the case of LT and lesion, you can have an increased motor distal latency here in case of demyelinage. If it's an axonal lesion, if you have denervation, in case of acute lesion, you can observe at rest fibrillations and positive sharp wave, abnormal activity. In case of chronic lesion of the axon, you will have polyphasic potentials here, and you, have, you will have a poor activity at voluntary contraction of the muscles. Now, what about the treatment? The treatment of the LTN lesion is mostly conservative because it's an injury by stretching. So the first thing you have to do is to stop the triggering activity because we know that this stretching uh, pathophysiology is related to some bad movements. For example, the serve at tennis. And if you don't consider the gesture modification before return to play, you expose the patient to recidive. The treatment is based on neuromuscular and compensatory rehabilitation exercise, including home exercise. The prognosis depends on the severity, on the kind of lesion. Is it a more demyelinating or uh, axonal loss? But is usually, usually good uh, given the pathophysiological lesion. If you do not observe any recovery after one to two years, you can consider muscle transfer. Now for the uh, spinal accessory nerve with an eventual trapezius palsy. This nerve is only susceptible to iatrogenic injury, sometimes to traumatic. For example, iatrogenic could be a, a lymph nodes biopsy. Clinically, you will observe here with this video also from Boris, you will observe a loss of neck webbing. It's difficult to see uh, the trapezius atrophy. Why? Because this muscle is very thin. You can observe a scar related to the injury or the surgery. And at the testing on the right on the video, you can see on the contrary of the LTN lesion, 
that the scapula is protracted, not retracted like in the, MT, the LTM. This test, uh, this uh, lesion is confirmed by EMG and the treatment is based on surgery uh, mostly. Now for the dorsal scapular nerve lesion and an eventual rhomboidus palsy. This is a very rare lesion and mostly related to interscale block. Clinically, the uh, winging is on the medial inferior scapular border and is mostly visible when you ask the patient to put his uh, hands on his hips and to push his elbow back against your manual resistance. This diagnosis is also confirmed by electromyography, but the treatment is here more conservative. Now some uh, words before to end this presentation about the specific scapular dyskinesis rehabilitation. And I told you before that it's important to base this rehabilitation on different things, a precise clinical evaluation of the scapular dyskinesis, also evaluation of the associated shoulder injury, to an analyze the biomechanical alteration and to integrate the shoulder issue in the kinetic chain. Remind that the goal of this rehabilitation is the shoulder homeostasis and uh, most important is to align the humeral head on the glenoid fossa, fossa statically at rest and dynamically during the motion. An algorithm I like, inspired by Coles, uh, simplifying the rehabilitation for sure. If the scapular dyskinesis is mostly related to a lack of soft tissue flexibility, muscle or ligaments, you have to prescribe and to do manual stretching exercise if this scapular dyskinesis is mostly related to lack of muscle performance. In case of muscle control disturbance, you have to base the rehabilitation on neuromuscular coordination exercise, beginning with analytic and going gradually to functional. And if it's a muscle strength issue, a program of strengthening and endurance training, trying to re-establish a very optimal ratio between agonies an antagonist. Thank you. Thank you, Thierry. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I will be honest with you. It's uh, probably the most complete and accurate presentation of scapular dyskinesis I've uh, heard uh, so far. And honestly, it was amazing. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And it's not because we are working together, but I learned a lot. It was very uh, didactic, and I'm, I'm sure the majority of the audience appreciate this. And uh, and I'm, I'm happy that it will stay on the on the channel because you know it's quite complex and controversial uh, uh, topics. And I think uh, people will be happy, and myself, to go back and to listen again your uh, your presentation for some uh, details. Um, so I will start with uh, one question uh, that uh, Faraz. Uh, Seti uh, asked, and this is this is obviously the first question that we can ask. He asked this question as uh, in that way: Is there such a thing as normal scapular movement? So, can you tell? Because you know, for me, scapular dyskinesis. I write scapular dyskinesis in my notes when I see an asymmetry in comparison to the opposite side. But it, do you have more uh, criteria to say that the scapular movement is normal or not normal? It's very difficult to assess, to say if a scapular motion is abnormal. And most of all, because you have to integrate the scapular motion in the shoulder motion. So, and you know that the biomechanics of the scapular motion, uh, the shoulder motion is very difficult because you have to integrate many movement, movement of the glenohumeral, or the sternoclavicular and osseous. So there is five different joints in the shoulder and that's difficult. So there is many scapular dyskinesis. For sure, it's true. But asymmetry is a factor. It's a way to assess if yes or not there is. But the problem is when you have a bilateral dysfunction, yes. static one with a bad position at rest or at motion. So what to do? And mostly when you have a scapular dyskinesis, bilateral and asymptomatic, what do you have to do? That's the most important question. But I think that if you have any doubt, the best is, as always in medicine, is to come back to anatomy and it's, it's to come back to biomechanics. So it's to do a perfect analysis of every component 
components of the, the sugar uh, biomechanics. I think that's the best. Very, uh, <clears throat> very interesting. And I have a question uh, just uh, going from uh, Bernard. Uh, upper limb surgeon, so he knows that very well. His question is, do you think the diagnosis can only be made on clinical examination in the case of nerve lesions? And what is the greatest benefit of EMG, a topic that you know by heart? Yeah, for sure. So uh, it's impossible to be sure that the scapular dyskinesis is related to any nerve issue. But we have to assess it. Because as for uh, fracture, for example, I had simple case. If you have a fracture, scapular fracture, you have a clavicle fracture, you have a muscle detachment, uh, or you have a neuropathy, it's simple. You just have first to feed the, the, the injury. Yeah. So it's important to do the diagnosis uh, at the beginning. And for the nerve, the only way to objectify a nerve injury, not only to objectify, but also to grade the nerve injury for the prognosis and for the treatment, it's LMG. You know perfectly if it's a nerve problem, you know which nerve, and you know what is the kind of lesion and the grade. So it's important for the patient because he knows what is the prognosis, or at least he has information about the prognosis, how long before the return to play. We know that's the most frequent uh, question we have coming from athlete. And we, as healthcare provider, we have many information for the treatment. Okay, thank you. And a, a practical question again from Faraz about the rehabilitation. Is, he asks, uh, in your experience of scapular dyskinesis rehabilitation, what should be the position of uh, highest emphasis in order to maximize scapular roles in function? So, uh, it's, it's the question, it's the question for the landscape provider. The first question is, do we have to treat the scapular dyskinesis if there is no symptom? But if there is an associated shoulder injury, after the further question, uh, what is to be treated first? If we have to rehabilitate, what to do? What to do? That's for the pure scapular dyskinesis. I will take this uh, example because it's the most easier if there is an, an easy example. If you have a scapular dyskinesis without other injury, scapular fracture, or what do we have to consider? I think that the first thing a physiotherapist or a PMNR has to do is to do the checkup of the biomechanic and of every components to capsule. Is there any tightness of posterior anterior capsule? Is there any weakness? As, as of the of some muscles, is there any tightness of some muscles? Be, because we know that uh, if we have this kind of problems, we will have a dysfunction of the shoulder, we will have a loss of efficiency of the shoulder, and any scapular dyskinesis is able to overload some tissue in or around the shoulder. So it's an open door to any shoulder injury, for example, instability or shoulder impingement. Uh, there is another question coming up. <clears throat> what are the, but I think, you know, what, what about the scapular retraction test and assistance scapular test? I will recommend the person who asked the question to maybe he was late because, you know, you explained very well during your presentation. Yeah. And this problem. just, uh, just. Uh, it's an important to, one. Because when you see to uh, remind that this video will be still available on the website. But uh, Thierry, probably you can uh, re-explain uh, shortly uh, the test. some more because it's an important point. So to see that there is a scapular disease kinesis, and we talked about this, it's not that simple first. But if you see or you have a suspicion of scapular dyskinesis, it's important to know if this scapular dyskinesis is related or not to symptoms, pain, disability, or shoulder injury. So if you give a correction, manual correction of this dyskinesis with your hand of examiner, you can see if yes or not, there is an influence on the pain or on the disability of the patient. So you try to know what is the dyskinesis of the scapula and you give the correction with your hand. You assist the movement. And in this case, if the pain if the pain decreases in the first assistance, it's a relation. 
you can consider that there is a relation between the scapular dyskinesia and the shoulder injury or the pain. If there is no modification, it's not related. Yeah. Um, I have some other question uh, <laughs> that uh, I would like to uh, ask you. And, uh, you know, for example, <clears throat> you mentioned the clavicle fracture and the, well, I'm sure orthopedic surgeon. So what about the combination association between, because we don't, to be honest, when we are orthopedic surgeon, we don't pay maybe not enough attention of that. And you, uh, specialists of physiotherapy, all the physiotherapists are uh, probably more focused on that, which is good. What is the association and relation between acromulcavicular dislocation or separation and scapular dyskinesis? Yes, uh, it's a good question because I didn't talk about this uh, association between acromioclavicular separation and uh, scapular dyskinesis. What we know is in grade two, the grade two instability of the AC joint induce an horizontal instability of the, this joint. If you have a grade three, you have an horizontal and you have a vertical instability of the AC joint. This induces a third translation movement in the scapular dyskinesis. So you will have a scapular dyskinesis sometimes. So what is important is to consider if you have to do a rehabilitation or of the scapula or uh, only a treatment of the, the AC joint. And there is an author, I think it's Morris, that described a new classification for the grade tree. And uh, described the grade three with scapular dyskinesis and the grade three without scapular dyskinesis. And he considered that in case of uh, instability grade three with uh, scapular dyskinesis, first is to be treated as the scapular dyskinesis. And if there is only instability, the first thing we have to consider is the, uh, the AC uh, lesions first. So it's because I believe that uh, if I understand your classification with inferior medial, inferior medial, medial and superior medial, uh, and this is the orthopedic surgeon who is talking then, uh, you know, the majority of people confuse when there is an AC joint grade three, they believe that the majority of people believe that the clavicle goes up. Sure. Actually, it's uh, the scapula goes down. So I probably, no, and I this is my clinical impression that the, the scapula move a little bit uh, and the uh, tilt, and yeah. then there is a uh, inferior medial uh, scapular dyskinesis. Is it the same thing for you? Yeah, I think it's important. And again, we come back to the analysis of the biomechanic of the shoulder in any scapular dyskinesis. It's for sure right. Uh, the most important thing in this AC dislocation, it's not the clavicle that's moving, it's the bad position of the scapula inducing the scapular dyskinesis. So again, it's important to check this dyskinesis for the treatment. And there is a question from Elfie, uh, which is, do you consider scapular hypermobility as a scapular dyskinesis? Uh, so scapular thoracic, yeah, because it's more scapular yeah, scapular thoracic. mobility, it's somewhere uh, dyskinesis, for sure. Because if you increase the upward rotation, for example, you expose the glenomural uh, joint and the subacromial joint to some overload, for sure. And some have described that it's a risk factor, for example, of labral lesion and glenomural instability. So for sure, uh, hypermobility of the scapular thoracic uh, joint, especially in upward rotation, is a risk factor for many lesions of the shoulder, yes. Another question from uh, Adash Mohan. Uh, he said he had a couple of patients with uh, scapular dyskinesis, and it took three, four attempts of EMG studies to detect the LTN palsy. And the question is, is it difficult to get the correct EMG result for uh, uh, LTN? I would say, uh, we have a very good EMGist, uh, Dr. Thierry, and uh, he always do the diagnosis, but uh, can you comment that? Yeah, for sure. For sure, it's not the easier muscles yeah. and nerve to assess. It's not, definitely. Because first thing you have to consider that in case of lesion of the LTN, uh, sometimes there is some digitation only that are affected. Uh, sometimes it's the upper the, the digitations and sometimes it's the lower and the dyskinesis is not the same. 
uh, but only for the ENMG. So the nerve conduction studies you have, it's relatively simple. It's not a big issue if you know the technique, but for the EMG, it's more difficult because you have to put a needle in the digitation. And the digitation, it means that you have to put the needle close to the rib and close also to the, the, the lung. So there is a risk of pneumothorax if you do it. So it needs uh, for sure some expertise to do this kind of investigation. And many, many electrophysiologists, specialists, they don't know how to do because it's a very specific investigation and electromyographies that are a little bit, they, ha they have knowledge in the sports physician and uh, sports injuries, they know how to do, but there is not a lot for sure. But I can say that uh, I've been working with you for years and I know that you do that very well, if, if it is the, the answer. But it's clearly that uh, we need experienced people for, do, for this um, yeah. quite uh, better, difficult... Better not to do it than to do it uh, with someone that doesn't know how to do it because it's risky in MG. So take the risk without any benefit. It's not very good. Uh, question from Bernard. Allemand, Dr. Bernard Allemand, is there any relation between the shortening after clavicle fracture and scapular dyskinesis? And do you know what shortening is tolerable? So what we can uh, accept? So, uh, again, for sure, the shortening of the clavicle induce a scapular disposition, I would say. Uh, only at rest, for sure, you will increase some posterior tilting probably you will have probably an upward rotation. So a translation of the a protraction of the, the, or you can have a protraction of the scapula. Uh, what is the tolerable uh, shortening? I don't know, really, I don't know. Okay. But because I'm a rehabilitator, so my aim is to know what is the consequence of the shortening of on the dyskinesia. If this shortening induces significant uh, dyskinesia and if this dyskinesia is able to provide some shoulder injury, for sure, I will ask the surgeon to do something. But I don't have clear measure, measurement of the tolerable uh, shortening. Yeah. And this is exactly what we think in the orthopedic surgery. It's, uh, it's quite controversial. Uh, what uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that the question is coming from uh, Dr. Bernard Allemand because it's difficult to answer. Another question from uh, Chiara White. Uh, she said, great presentation, agree. In order to achieve appropriate goals with rehabilitation and the scapular dyskinesis, what time frames do you recommend your patients give to rehabilitation? I believe the question means, yeah, if I understand the- For each session or along the rehabilitation uh, procedure? Uh, because, because there you is can, no maybe you can answer both. Sorry? I Sorry. think you can answer both. What is your, in your experience, the timing, uh, and the number? I think there is no standards. Why? Because there is many kinds of scapular dyskinesis first. Uh, if you have a scapular dyskinesis related to a, a glenomer osteoarthritis, and you consider to do rehabilitation before eventually to go to an arthroplasty, it's for sure not the same that if the scapular dyskinesis is related to a nerve injury. Uh, the, the treatment is absolutely different. Uh, if it's related to neuropathy, uh, every session takes time. Why? Uh, it's a simple reason. Because uh, there is, if there is an axonal, an axonal lesion of the nerve, there is a fatigue process in the muscles. Okay, so there is some kind of uh, modification in the recruitment of the fibers in the nerve, in the muscles. But this induces a fatigue phenomenon in the muscles. So it's better for this kind of patient to do 10 times two minutes exercise that one time 20 minutes. And it's important to consider home exercise for this kind of lesion. So the length of every session is really depending on the diagnosis and the associated uh, lesion. Now, how many times? It's impossible to say time, the necessary time, I would say. If it's a nerve lesion, it will take months if it's an axonal lesion, time for the nerve to regrow one millimeter a day. So if it's uh, a 25 centimeter lesion, it will take 250 days before to recover. Uh, if it's a simple uh, scapular dyskinesis uh, because of a loss of motor control, 
It's simple because only with feedback from the, the examiner, the patient can correct this kinesis, this, this kinesis. It's not a nerve lesion here. It's only a loss of proprioception. So with the correction from the examiner to re-establish a correct and harmonious movement of the, the, the shoulder, it's enough with some sessions. One, one question about the pathology, which is a bit gray in the gray zone, it's a snapping scapula. Yes. Uh, do, you, do you consider, I, I operate few cases in my life, not a lot, of course, because it's really uh, when the, physis, the conservative treatment is not enough, so it's rare. Do you consider it's, uh, it's um, part of scapular dyskinesis because you put that in the chapter or is it something which is uh, uh, separate, different or do we have both, you know, because we talk about bursitis. We have both. We have both. We have both. I, I told you in the presentation, uh, scapular dyskinesis could be a responsible factor and the only responsible factor of snapping scapula. In that case, you have only to rehabilitate the scapular dyskinesis. But you have also other kinds of snapping scapula. And it's a little bit difficult if it's a bursitis. It's simple, huh? you inject the bursitis and you are rid of the problem. Now, uh, in some other case, uh, do we have to go to surgery or to rehabilitate first? I think that each diagnosis should be considered. Uh, and in some case, you cannot do anything uh, with surgery. Uh, you have a thoracic kyphosis inducing a, scapula, a snapping scap scapula. So work on the scapular dyskinesis, eventually work a little bit on the, the, the support of the spine, but you don't have surgical solution uh, for many- Oh, you know, yeah. We Not for the osteochondroma, for example. Do we have to yeah. operate an osteochondroma? I think that's the best example we can give. Uh, it depends on the side of the osteochondroma. It depends also on the position of the osteochondroma. It's, if it's a very medial osteochondroma on the deep side of the scapula, it's relatively easy to remove it, surgically speaking. If it's a more deep or more lateral, it's a little bit more difficult to go and to remove this osteochondroma. And it's better maybe to begin with the rehabilitation. It's a discussion to have with a team, and that's the best we can do with our team, it's to discuss. Well, one more uh, comment, and uh, I will ask you to comment the comment if you uh, quickly, because we said one hour, but, and then at the end, I will ask you for a take home message. It's a comment from uh, Fetty Regay. Uh, he said that the muscle dysfunction, uh, you know, if we talk about the muscle dysfunction related to trigger uh, points, trigger points, dry needle plus rehab exercise, they are very helpful to restore muscle function and balance. What is your comment about that and your experience? For sure, for sure. If uh, you have a scapular dyskinesis related to a muscle tightness, because it's this, huh? it's a muscle retraction, muscle spasm, uh, the best is try to treat this. Uh, and every technique able to reduce the spasm is for sure welcome. So dry needling, yes, for sure. Uh, any technique that able to relax the contracture, massage, uh, heat, hot pads, uh, hot showers, uh, massage, all those techniques are uh, for sure uh, welcome. So thank you, uh, Thierry. I think uh, I will ask you now because it's time to leave almost. Do you have a take home message to, to summarize a little bit uh, your presentation? It's impossible to summarize your presentation because it's uh, so uh, so different pathology and controversial, but do you have a take more message for us? Uh, yeah, maybe some important thing because otherwise it's very difficult, but uh, some points I will, I would like to highlight, I will say, is I think that th there is a consensus about the association between scapular dyskinesis and many shoulder injuries. The problem is not this consensus. The problem is there is a lack of consensus about the relation the causative relation between the scapular dyskinesis and the shoulder injury. So I think that for some, and I told you, for some pathology, shoulder injury associated, it's easy, fracture and this kind of thing, it's easy. You treat the injury and you have a good result and maybe after you have to consider the shoulder dyskinesis, the scapular dyskinesis. But in many cases, it's difficult. And in that case, the most important thing to say to, to, to do is a perfect analysis of 
the skin diseases of the shoulder injury associated and the biomechanic. I think it's the best you can do, but never forget that it's, I think it's an heresy to consider a shoulder injury without taking into account an eventual scapular dyskinesis and the rehabilitation of the dys dyskinesis. I think it's a good conclusion. So it means probably we underestimate the scapular dyskinesis. I think physiotherapists are more conscious about that than the orthopedic surgeon, uh, because you know they, they, know, they know very well these kind of things. So uh, thank you for this uh, conclusion. And uh, we will have to stop because we could discuss well, hours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank everyone to be uh, present and to uh, uh, have been uh, very active in the question. Uh, again, uh, for those who arrive late, uh, be sure that you can uh, access to this uh, nice presentation and uh, excellent presentation and very nice uh, discussion on the DX Bond uh, YouTube channel. I will um, ask you to come back uh, on, in one week for another presentation done by Dr. Bernard Allemand, who will talk about uh, the lateral elbow pain, and he will show you, and it will be very interesting, that uh, it's not only tennis elbow, and we will, uh, I'm sure you will, be, you will enjoy that. And uh, thank you, everyone, to, be, uh, to follow uh, DX Bone channel. Don't forget to subscribe here. I don't know if we're here, Don. And uh, see you in uh, one week. I will end this meeting because it's one hour now. Thank you, Thierry. Thank you, Philip, and thank you to everyone. Bye. Bye.